The next part of this story really is the biggest area of contention. Buckle up, because it's full of legal disputes and perhaps some backstabbing. Tom Rolander backs up Kildall's claim that IBM had agreed to meet, at short notice, with Digital Research on a Friday. Gary informed IBM that he would be at a previously scheduled client meeting with a CPM distributor, Bill Goldboot, at his factory in Oakland and so informed IBM that it would not personally be available to meet them until the afternoon. And whilst they were welcome to start proceedings over the non-disclosure and any other legal matters in his absence with the company lawyer and his wife Dorothy, who, as you may remember, was the business operator of Digital Research. Now, the computer folklore version of this story from here on in, told by many people, including by Bill Gates, was that Gary was off having a pleasure cruise in his personal plane at the time that IBM arrived and that he never met with them. According to Gary and friends and colleagues, this is wholly untrue. There's a picture of Gary and myself. Uh, he always liked this picture. Um, the two of us got in one of those photo booths down on the Cannery Row. and I, and. The expression on my face there is, I can't breathe, because he jammed me in the corner next to the wall. But uh, <laughs> at any rate, um, Gary and I became best friends. He was best man at my wedding. I was best man at his wedding. And we did a lot of flying together. So he was uh, truly, a, truly a close friend. What, what really happened at that time, or, and these are sort of my words, and, and you know, having been there, um, what happened is IBM was building this personal computer. We didn't know that they were building one. Today, a new IBM computer has reached a personal scale. A person can afford it. The idea of the small computer has become so big that the giant of computer companies, IBM, is busy marketing its new small computer. It plays bridge, it plays checkers, it balances checkbooks, it can be used for a typewriter, it can be used for word processing applications, it can communicate with other personal computers over the telephone line, and you know, who knows, it may be the world's biggest backyard fence to talk over before long. This video is sponsored by the very wonderful people at PCBWay. PCBWay are the leading electronics and prototyping manufacturer. If you've got an idea, you can use PCBWay to turn it into a reality. PCBWay can build PCBs from just $5 and build them for you in around 24 hours. Now, what I really love is that for people that suck at using a soldering iron like myself, you can upload your PCB file and have PCBWay assemble it all for you. PCBWay also do 3D printing, CNC machining, sheet metal fabrication, injection molding and so much more. They are widely reputed by us in the retro computing community as being the go-to supplier of your PCB needs. So if you've got an idea for an electronics project, why don't you give PCBWay a try at PCBWay.com. After all, that is the PCBWay. We thank PCBWay for sponsoring Al's Geek Lab. Now, let's get back to the video. Well, out of the blue, Gary gets a call on the phone and the call, I believe it was on a Wednesday, um, Gary gets a call from Bill Gates. And Bill tells him that he's got a visitor in his office that he's sending down to see Gary. Can't tell him who he is, but treat him right. I mean, I give Bill credit for, for that kind of a setup. What, what was Microsoft before this? Microsoft, Microsoft before this was languages. Yeah. Microsoft was basic. Yeah, basic. They were languages. They had no operating system. Yeah. And in fact, what the, the, a little more of the context there was that IBM needed an operating system for their new machine. All right, well, there was the assumption then that Microsoft was CPM. They had the operating system. So I never actually had that verbally confirmed to me, but it sure looked like IBM went to Microsoft to build to think they could get CPM. We're told they couldn't. Bill then, in turn, passed them down to digital research. That was on a Wednesday. We got a call. Uh, Gary got a call from Bill. They want to come down. The next call Gary gets is from somebody at IBM. They want to come down two days later on a Friday. They thought we had an operating system. Because we had this soft card product that had CPM on it, they thought we could license some CPM for this new personal computer they told us they wanted to do. And we said, well, no, we're, we're not in that business. And when we discovered we didn't have the he didn't have the rights to do that and that it was not he said but i think it's ready i think Dick gary's got it ready to go <clears throat> i said well no but no time like the present call up gary well gary had already scheduled a meeting with bill godbout 
Bill was the president of CompuPro, I believe it was the company, they're up in Oakland. And we were scheduled to go up and deliver some software to them and meet with them on Friday morning. Gary said, I can't meet Friday morning, but I'll be back by roughly lunchtime and I'll be happy to meet them. Okay, so that was fine. So Gary and I flew up on that Friday morning up to Oakland, met Bill, had our meeting, came on back down. Meanwhile, what happened was IBM came in suits to the Victorian home over here. And the first thing they presented to Dorothy, who was uh, Gary's ex-wife, um, was a, uh, a, license, a non-disclosure agreement, basically. Yeah. Okay. Essentially, what it was is unidirectional. It was anything you say to me is regarded as public domain, but anything I say to you is proprietary, cannot be repeated, etc. Well, this really ruffled Dorothy's uh, feathers a bit. Gary was, they had some other plans, and so he said, well, uh, Dorothy will see you. And uh, so we went down the three of them. IBM showed up with an IBM non-disclosure, and, and Dorothy made what I, what, a decision which I think it's easy in retrospect to say was dumb. Well, we popped out our letter that said, uh, uh, please don't tell anybody we're here, and we don't want to hear anything confidential. And uh, she read it, and she said, I can't sign this. She did what her job was. She got the lawyer to look at the non-disclosure. The lawyer, uh, Jerry Davis, who's still in Monterey, uh, threw up on this uh, non-disclosure. It was uncomfortable for IBM. They weren't used to being waiting, and, and, and it was an unfortunate situation. Here you are in a tiny Victorian house that's overrun with people and chaotic. And So we spent the whole day in Pacific Grove debating with them and with our attorneys and her attorneys and everybody else about whether or not she could um, even talk to us about talking to us. And we left. And we had we had hundreds of OEMs at that time, hundreds of companies that had, we had a mutual non-disclosure agreement and gone through all that, and so why should IBM be any different? Dorothy was really uncomfortable about signing that one. So the meeting kind of came to an impasse at that point. Well, uh, Gary and I came and arrived to the meeting, and things were a little ruffled at that point. Um, I went off to my computer, Gary went in the meeting, and apparently they worked out the details of, of signing some agreement to do this. So, um, the other things that became issues in the meeting was IBM didn't want to pay a royalty. They wanted a fully paid up license, I think it was 250000 and they didn't want to call it CPM. They wanted to call it PCDOS. So here, they wanted to change the name, they wanted different licensing, and none of these were, were things that were the way digital was doing business. And in, and in a sense, digital could not, if they had uh, uh, provided that, uh, licensing and an agreement with IBM, they would then have had to open themselves up to all the rest of the companies, or they would have been in an unfair, you know, compete. They, they couldn't have done that. So we held our position. That is the way we wanted to do it. Microsoft had signed IBM's incredibly one-sided agreement, probably because they were a small company with a couple of products and no operating system to market. They had very little to lose by signing. Digital Research, on the other hand, were a dominant company in the market at the time, earning more than $5.4 million a year, mostly from CPM. DRI Software was on more than 3,000 models of computer. You could say that Digital Research was the Microsoft of the late 70s. By the accounts of all in the know at Digital Research, IBM worked with Gary over the remaining hours and they came to an agreement, and Gary signed an amended non-disclosure agreement. IBM then finally revealed the plans for what was then known as Project Chess, the new IBM PC. IBM, distinctly unimpressed with their reception, went back to Microsoft. Bill Gates isn't the man to give a rival a second chance. He saw the opportunity of a lifetime. Digital research didn't seize that, and we knew it was essential. If somebody didn't do it, the project was going to fall apart, so... <laughs> we just got carried away and said, look, we can't afford to lose the language business. That was the initial thought. We can't afford to have IBM not go forward. This is the most exciting thing that's going to happen in PCs. And we were already out on the limb because we had licensed them not only BASIC, but Fortran, COBOL, Assembler, uh, Typing Tutor, Adventure. And basically, every, every product the company had, we had committed to do for IBM in a very short time frame. So on one hand, we have IBM and Microsoft apparently now doing a deal over an operating system. Yet on the other hand, Gary believes that there is a deal to be made with IBM for the operating system 
and other aspects as well, such as a multitasking operating system that's in the works for 16-bit processors. So, who's to believe? Kildall and Rolander both advised that the future of personal computing, especially as IBM had already chosen a next-generation 16-bit CPU for their PC, would be much more suited to have a more powerful operating system that digital research were creating, known as MPM86, a multitasking operating system that was compatible with the Intel 16-bit CPUs and backwards compatible with the existing CPM software base. CPM would only perform a one task at a time on the more limited 8-bit processors. The power of 16-bit CPUs meant that there was now a possibility an operating system could perform multiple tasks at the same time. For example, print a document whilst accessing other files on a disk, or perhaps even showing multiple windows of activity on a screen. It also supported networking, the joining together of computers on the same network, which we all take for granted today. All of this was so ahead of its time, nobody was doing this in 1980. But as usual, Gary was ahead of the curve. Well, I was brought back in the meeting a little later on to give a presentation of MPM. MPM was the multitasking operating system that I had written for digital research, and it was what we believe would be the flagship on the 16-bit processors. Why would you do single tasking on a 16-bit processor with that much memory? You know? So our, our real intent was to push for the MPM. That isn't really, you know, what they were looking for initially. They just wanted a 16-bit operating system. As mentioned, Rolander had been hard at work on both CPM86 as well as MPM86. Sensing the discontentment, Kildall changed the offering slightly to suggest that CPM86 could be a stepping stone to the IBM PC consumers who might want multitasking at a later date. In the end, IBM offered digital research $250,000 for CPM86 outright. So, um, the other things that became issues in the meeting was IBM didn't want to pay a royalty. They wanted a fully paid up license, I think it was $250,000. And they didn't want to call it CPM. They wanted to call it PC-DOS. So here, they wanted to change the name. They wanted different licensing. And none of these were, were things that were the way digital was doing business. And in, and in a sense, digital could not if they had uh, uh, provided that uh, licensing and an agreement with IBM, they would then have had to open themselves up to all the rest of the companies, or they would have been in an unfair, you know, compete. They, they couldn't have done that. So we held our position. That is the way we wanted to do it. IBM probably knew little of digital research at this time. They probably thought that they were some small company. Indeed, IBM at this time were used to the big business of the mainframe market. This likely meant that they undervalued CPM and digital research. However, to be fair to IBM, Gary didn't exactly believe that the IBM PC would be a winner either, especially given that there were potentially hundreds of contenders for the top spot at the time. Apple was only one of them. In the end, Gary was uneasy selling the product outright to IBM and countered with a $10 per copy license royalty. This was in line with the same fee as all other original equipment manufacturers that digital research worked with at the time. In Harold Evans' book, it's also clear that Gary worried that if he broke out of the $10 royalty model and allowed the flat fee arrangement exclusively to IBM, this would likely upset the other OEMs that were digital research's customers and potentially lead to litigation against them. The only fair model to all was to offer a royalty model. Years later, Kildall wrote that, despite this licensing matter still seeming a little bit contentious with IBM, who also insisted renaming CPM as PC-DOS, Gary believed that they were close to a deal. Gary also believed that nobody else had an operating system for the new 16-bit range of Intel processors. As the day drew to a close, Kildall recalled shaking hands in general agreement with the IBM team. Gary was due to fly out that evening for a family holiday and says that he even bumped into the IBM team again as they took the plane to Florida. As Gary chatted some more with the IBM team, Gary recalls offering up ways that CPM could be adapted for the IBM PC. After that, the Kildall family were in the Caribbean for a week. As soon as he got back, Gary put in call after call to the IBM team. However, all he received was radio silence.
Due to the non-disclosure agreements, and certainly a general desire to keep things secret, the details of what IBM did next are murky at best. However, it would appear that one of the IBM team, likely Jack Sams, decided to meet up with Bill Gates. Quite why he felt the need to return to Bill, despite being told that he did not have an operating system for IBM, seems, well, a little fishy. If you recall earlier in the year, Tim Patterson, the engineer that worked near to Microsoft in Seattle for Seattle computer products, had helped Microsoft with the Z80 soft card. You may also recall that Tim had convinced Rod Brock, his manager, that the new 16-bit Intel 8086 CPU was the future. Rod had relented, allowing Tim to work on new hardware products for the x86 CPU. Tim knew that once all the hardware stuff was finished, the SCP computer kits would need an operating system. Frustrated with the fact that the CPM86 operating system for the 8086 CPU was not yet available to the public, Tim decided to take matters into his own hands. Tim knew CPM very well, what with it being the industry standard for the time. So I took a CPM manual that I'd gotten from the retail computer store, $5 in 1976 or something, and uh, used that as the basis for uh, the, what the, what we, the application programming interface, the API for my operating system. And so uh, using these, these ideas that uh, came from different places, I started in April and it was about half time for four months I, uh, before I had my, my first working version. What happened next was later described in the magazine as theft. According to a number of sources, Tim used the built-in debugger in CPM called DDT. The debugger allowed him to analyze the code of CPM enough so that he could effectively copy its functions, specifically its API, as well as its utilities and its look and feel. It, it was rumored that Gary uh, told people that he knew of bugs in, uh, in DOS that were th that he yeah, were knew, replicated. Yeah, that he knew the yeah. reason they were there. Was that true? That that was that was true. Um, it was more true in the eight bit version. The author of the magazine article, who happened to be a friend of Gary's, John Wharton, an ex Intel engineer, was quoted as saying, "For Mr. Patterson to cite the unavailability of CPM eighty six as justification for appropriating the look and feel of a competing operating system and its utilities seems to me analogous to telling the judge, I needed the car, your honor, and the plaintiff wouldn't sell me his, so I was forced to take it. Work by Patterson to get his operating system off the ground started in April 1980. In addition to the reverse engineering of the code using the DDT debugger, Tim went to work copying the all important API references from the CPM reference manuals so that his operating system would offer compatibility with CPM calls. The ability for his operating system to use the same API references as CPM would give it interoperability with CPM software after translating its source code to Patterson's operating system. For example, if Patterson's DOS needed to read a file from a disk or output to a screen or a printer, the same API interrupt numbers would be used. Patterson called his operating system QDOS, which stood for quick and dirty operating system. Um, there are people, uh, John Wharton has one of, been one of my friends for years, and, and he, he has documented some situations, I think it was in the console handler or something like that, where the same error that was in CPM86 was in fact replicated in, in QDOS. But at any rate, to me, what's not important here is that, that, that the, whether any code was copied. Whether Tim Patterson ever looked at a line of code or copied the code is not the issue to me. What he really did is he took it as, as an architecture. Yeah. In fact, Gary, if anything, the, the, the supreme accomplishment he made was to make it easy to be copied. Because Gary used this in 21, this interface from an application program through to the operating system that made it transparent. It, 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 it uh, basically made it so that you couldn't see the actual organization of the data on the disk itself physically. So whether it was a CPM file system or whether it was a FAT file system, 
the application program, you know, one level couldn't see that at all because it just used the int to open a file, read and write a file, and so forth. And, and now we take that kind of API for granted, don't yeah, we? Yeah, yeah, we absolutely, we all, Even all in Facebook, of us. Facebook, right? We, we Facebook, are, you know, yes. When, when we yes. use Facebook, we, yep. we're talking to an API and we have no clue what the machine is, where the machine stored, what. You are layers above that. And that actually is, is, I think if there's anything that I, I really think Gary should be remembered for is, is being the creator, the originator of that layering of the software so that you were able to take the application program and run it on any piece of hardware. I mean, we all take it for granted right now. Not much later, SCP renamed the product 86DOS. However, the nickname QDOS has survived the annals of time. Years later, after many individuals attesting that Patterson ripped off CPM, Patterson maintained that QDOS was all his original work. He vehemently denied allegations that he referred to CPM code, even suing for defamation in 2004. And there, there's a, a recent lawsuit that's gone through that. In fact, um, this is a very interesting read for any of you that might not have seen it. This is the actual uh, opinion from uh, Judge Zilly. Um, because it turned out that Tim Patterson uh, sued uh, Harold Evans for defamation, and the defamation he claimed was was in was in this book, because in this book um, uh, Harold claimed that QDOS was essentially a ripoff or clone of CPM, and uh, I would say Tim Patterson took umbrage with that and sued Harold Evans. Well. Uh, this is the result of that particular lawsuit. And let me just read the last uh, couple sentences out of this. Conclusion. The court grants the defendant's motion for summary judgment. Plaintiff Tim Patterson has failed to provide evidence that statements in Sir Harold Evans' chapter on Gary Kildall are provably false or defamatory. Statements in the Kildall chapter constitute non-actionable opinion protected by the First Amendment or statements that are not provably false. In addition, as a limited purpose figure, Mr. Patterson has failed to provide any evidence that Sir Harold Evans acted with actual malice. The court grants the defendant motion for summary judgment. So essentially that, that case was uh, dismissed. <clears throat> Back to Microsoft and Bill Gates had become aware of Tim's QDOS project. Again, history is a little vague here, but apparently when IBM's Jack Sams met with Bill Gates for the second time, Sams advised Gates to get a license for QDOS. There's a local company here in, in, uh, in Seattle called Seattle Computer Products, a guy named Tim Patterson, and he had done an operating system, very rudimentary operating system that was kind of like CPM. And we just told IBM, look, we'll go get this operating system from the small local company, we'll take care of it, we'll fix it up, and you can still do a PC. So this is what transpired. Microsoft purchased a non-exclusive license of what was now called 86DOS for $25,000. Later, in May of 1981, Microsoft then hired Tim Patterson away from SCP, and two months later, just a month before the release of the IBM PC, Microsoft purchased all rights from SCP for 86DOS for a sum of $50,000. But then we went back and said to them, look, you know, we want to buy this thing. And SCP was, like most little companies, they, you know, always needed cash. And so that was when they went into the negotiation. And uh, so ended up working out a deal to, uh, uh, to buy the operating system uh, from him for, for, for whatever usage we, you know, we wanted for $50,000. IBM gave a few stipulations to Bill Gates. Apparently, they had said that the operating system should look like CPM and that it should be easy to adapt CPM software to it using the Trans86 utility, which adapted programs that ran on CPM 8-bit Intel 8080s or Z80s into x86 compatible binaries. In an interview with Tim in 1983, Patterson said that IBM wanted PC-DOS to look more CPM-like. Here is what Tim said on the matter. IBM wanted CPM prompts. It made me throw up. Regardless of Patterson being at odds with IBM's requests, he complied. With IBM's stipulations made, and amidst flagrant disregard for the intellectual property of digital research's CPM, 
the development of what became PC-DOS was well underway. Tim Patterson stated that the development of QDOS was rapid. It is believed that Tim worked on the final elements of PC-DOS with Microsoft employee Bob O'Rear, as well as many bug fixes and QA elements from IBM engineers in Boca Raton. During the ongoing license agreement negotiations between IBM and Microsoft, IBM agreed that it would only license DOS from Microsoft, not buy it outright. This was a massive stroke of genius on Gates' behalf. Microsoft would retain the ability to resell DOS to any other company that so chooses to purchase licenses off it. Of course, we don't just want to sell it to you outright. We want to be able to license it to you. You want to retain ownership? Right. Well, the profits are in the computers themselves, not this software stuff. Hmm. No big deal. Oh, and one other thing. We have to be able to sell it to other outfits. IBM didn't know it then, but this small clause in the agreement was going to bite them in a huge way in the years to come. The key to our, the structure of our deal was that IBM had no control of our, over our licensing to other people. And the lesson of the computer industry in mainframes was that uh, over time people built compatible machines or clones, whatever term you want to use. And so really the primary upside on the deal we have with IBM, because they had a fixed fee, uh, we got about $80,000 and we got some other money for some special work we did, uh, but no royalty from them. And that's the DOS in basic as well. And so we were hoping a lot of other people would come along and do compatible machines. Well, they really hit with a vengeance in 85. The prices were going down on the uh, competitive products at about 30% every six months. A terror would be a good, uh, <laughs> a good phrase. Terror? Oh, of course. I mean, it was getting, I mean, we were able to sell a lot of products, but it was getting difficult to make money. And where did every clone maker buy his operating system? Microsoft, of course. By the mid-80s, it was boom time for Bill. The teenage entrepreneur had predicted a PC on every desk and in every home running Microsoft software. It was actually coming true. Despite the exclusivity deal that Microsoft had invested for 86 DOS over 1980, both Microsoft and Patterson had fended off legal and professional charges involving DOS, including a settlement over a contract dispute brought by Seattle Computer Products, which cost Microsoft $1 million in 1986. Part of the dispute included a statement that Microsoft either deceived or at least knowingly withheld the fact that there was a large buyer for 86 DOS when they acquired it. In July 1981, exactly one month before the IBM PC was announced to the world, Microsoft were free to resell the product to other companies badged as Microsoft DOS, or MS-DOS as it was best known. The initial PC-DOS and MS-DOS products were effectively identical. When an owner started up their IBM PC, they would be greeted with the prompt for the user to enter an instruction at the DOS prompt. The prompt the user would see was an A followed by a greater than symbol. The prompt that a CPM user would see was A followed by a colon. Furthermore, DOS shipped with the utilities or built-in commands. Some of them, like DIR, did exactly the same thing as CPM's DIR. If you type DIR, it would show you the files on the disk directory. The same for type and ren. Finally, the ed command was renamed to edlin. Edlin was written by Tim Patterson in two weeks whilst he was working on 86DOS and is quoted as saying that he was horrified to find out that IBM decided to ship it with PC-DOS. He claimed that he wanted to edit text files whilst working on DOS. Edlin became the de facto text editor in DOS between 1981 and DOS 5, which was released a decade later. To say that the similarities between CPM and DOS were strikingly similar was the understatement of the century. Tim Patterson even agreed to a point that there were similarities. He is quoted as saying, there is no significant dispute on the actual relationship between DOS and CPM. The relationship is simply this. DOS implements the same application program interface, or API, as CPM. 
the API is how an application program, such as a word processor, asks the operating system to perform a task, such as to read or write a disk file. Shortly before the IBM PC was released, Gary Kildall found out about the deal between Gates and IBM, uncovering that the operating system shipping with the IBM PC was effectively a ripoff of CPM. Gary believed that PC-DOS infringed on CPM, and he was horrified. He exclaimed, but Bill wouldn't do this to me. He wouldn't cut my throat. He's my friend. But cut his throat is exactly what Bill Gates did. Gary consulted with his lawyer, Jerry Davis. David believed that the intellectual property law that surrounded software, which was only put in place earlier in 1981, was not clear-cut enough to prosecute against IBM. Regardless, Gary got on the phone to IBM shortly after he heard about this news. Gary was known by many to be a mild-mannered man, but finally, this had enraged him. Gary threatened to sue IBM but an alternative agreement was made. What Gary didn't know is that this agreement would come back to bite him again. The deal that IBM so generously offered to Gary was that they would sell the PC with CPM86 or alternatively PC-DOS, giving the consumer the ultimate choice of operating system. This in return for Gary's agreement not to sue. It is said that Gary didn't see the IBM PC had a strong future, so Gary relented. He also probably thought that like on all previous microcomputers, the popularity of CPM would mean purchasing CPM over some unknown PC DOS. It would be a no-brainer for the users of the PC. Gary reasonably believed that CPM would be the preferred choice for the consumer. When the original IBM PC was released, the computer shipped with Microsoft BASIC built into the ROM, but other than that, IBM sold the PC without bundling an operating system. Perhaps this was because they were worried that Kildall would end up suing them. So what happened was that uh, we learned, and I believe it was Andy Johnson Laird, that, that Bill had licensed this software and licensed it to IBM, and that IBM was proceeding with PC-DOS, which we knew was based on QDOS, which we believe was based on our architecture. So the next thing that Gary did is he had our attorney, Jerry Davis, send a letter off to IBM saying, guys, you, uh, we, we are in the process already of suing Seattle Computer Products for copying our operating system. IBM said immediately, whoa, next thing we heard was attorneys, and they wanted to come out and meet with us. So they sent a group of people out to meet with digital research. Okay, this time in the meeting, they were going to pay our, I think it was $10, $10 per copy royalty cost. They said, okay, we'll call it CPM. We won't change the name to DOS. We will, um, uh, in fact, we'll hire you to write the BIOS for it. And we'll make this a level playing field. We've decided we're not going to bundle the operating system with the hardware. So when the computer ships, you get a computer. No operating system. Okay, and you have your choice of the UCSDP system. If you remember that, their Pascal system. Or you can buy PC-DOS or you can buy CPM86. So we'll let the customer choose. So we, Gary and I remember looking at each other going, this is a no-brainer. You know, why not? This is a great deal for us. Um, they're doing business the, the way we want to do it. And then we got the catch. The catch was we couldn't sue IBM for any kind of copyright or any infringement. Well, that, that took a separate discussion. Gary and I took a walk down the beach, which is two blocks from here, and uh, discussed this and decided IBM was not going to succeed. I mean, who would believe that this big company IBM could be successful in this personal computer market? They're going to pay us to write the BIOS, I don't know, 100000 or whatever it was. Let's take the money up front. They're going to give us advance royalties and let's run with it. Um, I don't know how many people you'll ever talk with that will admit that they did not believe that IBM was going to be successful. I'm one of them. And certainly Gary was one of them. So at any rate, we said, we'll go ahead and sign this. So Gary signed the document, we went ahead, wrote the BIOS, proceeded. Okay, so some months later is the rollout for the PC. And Gary and I took the plane, flew up to San Jose, took a cab over to the computer store where we were going to get our PC and our copy of the software. So we come running into this computer store, uh, I believe it was in Santa Clara, and uh, up to the shelf and we look, and here's the computer, here's the three boxes of software. Okay, well, 
Here was PC-DOS with a $40 price tag on it. Next to it in the box was CPM86, $240. So we have the same operating system, a six to one difference in price. That's it. That was the end, that was end of story, end of game, game over. Uh, I think from there on it was kind of a steady slide down. Uh, digital research did have multitasking, they were out there early. We had a strong European backing from oh, Siemens and Nixdorf and a lot of the other manufacturers, Olvedi and others that were kind of more independent. We're not going to go take something that IBM had rubber stamped or so, so forth. Um, but it was certainly very difficult for, for digital research to proceed after that. But that's my story. Would-be IBM PCs developers would also be aware of this IBM CPM premium, making them less inclined to write software for CPM versus PC-DOS. All of this meant that software availability for CPM86 was also not as good as it could have been. Now, one would have thought that the massive software library for CPM would be a great draw, yet porting software from the 8-bit Z80 or Intel 8080 machines was not a user-friendly undertaking. Despite favourable reviews in PC Magazine of June 1982, where Jim Edlin writes, In a feature-for-feature -feature comparison, CPM86 is strong where PC-DOS is weak. It was all too little, too late for digital research. Edlin also went on to note the striking similarities between the way that PC-DOS worked compared to CPM. Edlin wrote, The key function calls by which programs employ the operating systems are virtually identical between the two, further conceding that converting software from older versions of CPM to either PC-DOS or CPM86 was about equal. Find out how the story ends in tragedy in the conclusion to Gary Kildall. The man who should have been Bill Gates.